Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, so we, uh, a bit sorry that I took so long to do it, but I, uh, we sort of, you know, we sort of <coughs> saw a, a lot of things in the, in the process. So we've shown this uh, uh, version of han banach theorem for operator spaces, which is an extension of completely bounded maps. And in parallel, the extension property of completely positive maps on operator system, which is the han banach for operator systems. And we saw this uh, <coughs> factorization property of completely bounded and completely positive maps. So, so perhaps I can start today by doing a, a, a first result which has some connection really to quantum information theory in the sense that it's a well-known result in operator algebra theory that has a different name in quantum information theory, <coughs> which uh, I think they call it uh, Krauss decomposition. <coughs> And I think in operator algebra theory, it's, it's attributed to, to Hagero. <coughs> it's, it's a theorem that just gives you a description of what happens when you consider <coughs> linear maps between matrix algebras, OK? And you want to know when such a linear map is completely positive. So the theorem is that <coughs> U is <coughs> completely positive <coughs> if and only if uh, there exists uh, a family uh, of, of operators uh, VI <coughs> with a cardinality of I less than uh, <coughs> NM uh, such that you can write, so I would say operators between what and what, such that uh, UA is just the, the sum I in I <coughs> of VI uh, A the I star, and then uh, so our A, uh, our U A acts on n dimensional space, but A here acts on n dimensional space, right? So I must have that this V I goes from uh, <coughs> V I goes. <coughs> Just correct me if I if I from mess up. End to end. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, well, we have a description of completely positive maps. So, so we know how uh, we should do it. We know from the abstract from the abstract theory. We're now applying okay this big abstract theorem to a very simple case, but. What is the Okay. Okay. Um, so we are applying. We are applying. You know, this uh, big thing. We know that we have that. Okay. And uh, this is a priori. We had it like this. We had uh, some uh, representation. B of H hat, and then our map V should be a map from L2 of dimension N. So maybe I should explain this notation, but it's clear for me L2 of dimension N is N dimensional Hilbert space, okay? With a canonical basis. So this is CN with a usual Hilbert space norm. <coughs> so V is going to go from L to M to this uh, h hat. <coughs> okay, so, but, but in the case of mn, okay, it's very easy to describe what is a representation. So for any pi, okay, so this is a, an, an easy classical fact, which essentially is, you know, linear algebra, or Hilbert space linear algebra type, which is that for any pi from mn to, to d of h hat, automatically, uh, you have the following, that uh, your H can be written as, uh, okay, so maybe formally there exists H, such that H hat splits as <coughs> the, the tensor product of L2N <coughs> and H, and in such a way that... Why do you use unity? Sorry? 
So, sorry? Is your unity? No, not yet. No, no. Here, here not necessary. So That's just. What do you pi is unit? Pi is unit all, uh, if we wish, yeah. By the way, since you mentioned it, uh, I, I just realized afterwards that somebody asked me, maybe it was you, I think, if, uh, or, or, or maybe uh, that if I, we can always get pi unital, and I said, yes, I confirm. But then yesterday at the end of the proof, when I defined this sigma, my pi in the end of the proof was not unital. So I leave it as an exercise for you to do the correction. Correction is trivial to do, okay? But in the end of the proof yesterday, my pi was not unital. But it's very easy to do. I wrote, I, I, I use the matrix x and 0 everywhere. You just use x, x, and 0, 0, and that, that does it. So it's very trivial to, to, to correct. OK, <coughs> so, so pi a will now act on h hat. h hat is this tensor product, just as a tensor the identity, which means that you know if this h hat is viewed as a <laughs> space of n tuples of element of h, your matrix acts just like the usual matrices, just your, your vectors, instead of having scalar coordinates, they have coordinates in h. Okay? And, uh, and so that's, that's all we have. And so we have, we have now this thing. So our u of a <coughs> is uh, a tensor identity times this, this v, okay? <coughs> so maybe uh, let's write it now uh, like that. U a c eta <coughs> will be equal to uh, a tensor identity times v c v eta. Okay, that's what we have for any <coughs> c eta in uh, L two <coughs> m. So now our v, now our v, of course, is a map from L2m to uh, L2n tensor h. So this v, I can write like that. V c, I can write as <coughs> equal to the sum of uh, v i c tensor e i i in i, <coughs> where uh, I just identify h with L2 i. So if you like, uh, okay, e i is an orthonormal basis of my, of my h, okay? And all we care about, of course, is, is this thing. Now, note that, in fact, you see now, our operator v is defined on a space of dimension m. And all we care about is, is of course, these images. All, all we care about is these images. So the, the fact <coughs> from linear algebra <laughs> is that, in fact, there exists a, an h1 inside h with dimension h1 less than nm, such that the, the range of this v, so v of L2m, is actually included in L2n tensor h1. And to convince you of that, what, what I can do, well, let's see, do I want to do it or not? I don't know. Uh, 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 yeah, I, well, let's look at V of, uh, well, this is, the notation will be as usual with bases. You have, you know, the, the vals of indices. So V of V of EJ will be <coughs> the sum of, now, differently will be the sum of EI tensor. Now, something maybe V EJ and then the ith coordinate, the ith, that, that denotes the ith coordinates, okay, of VEJ, okay? <coughs> and so you see that uh, the, the, the span, so this V of L2N <coughs> is included, so we can take, <coughs> we can take, so this, this holds, this holds, okay, clearly if uh, H1 is taken to be the span of all these guys, V, E, J, I. This is this V, E, J, I, if you follow what I'm, my notation, which I don't to, to, want to spell out all the notation, I think it's pretty clear just from the conventions of linear algebra, okay? So this guy is in H, and you see that the, the indices I and J, one of them is in N, the other one is up to M, so <coughs> dimension of this H1 is less than NM. Okay, so now, 
Now we're in business. This set I is, uh, in fact, of uh, cardinality less than nm. <coughs> we can go back here and use what we wrote here. So now we have ua psi eta, OK, equals to this uh, A tensor identity uh, applied to. So I now use this. So I hope the notation is not too confusing because, OK, I've noted, uh, I've noted e, EI, one basis, EJ, another basis, but OK. I hope it's not too bad. Scalar, the sum of VJ eta tensor EJ. OK. And now you see that this is orthonormal. So of course, the rules of the scalar product with a tensor product is such that uh, we have only the diagonal sum. So we get sum i in i of a tensor identity <coughs> of, sorry, of a vi xi vi eta times ei ei, which is 1. So that's, in fact, all there is. And so we get sum i in i of vi star a vi xi eta. So we are done. So we have, we have proved this because this guy is the same as this guy for any pair of vector xi and eta. So I said that this is the, the first connection with quantum information theory. So I might as well stick in the, the definition because, uh, uh, in fact, if this, this u from uh, mn to uh, mn preserves the trace, okay, so is cp and preserves the trace, then it is called this is what they call a quantum channel. <coughs> so a quantum channel has this decomposition. And they, they are interested in uh, quantum information theory to, to, to actually you know, minimize this thing. I think they call it maybe the rank. Maybe they call it the Krauss rank. I'm not sure. But of course, they're interested in <coughs> you know, finding uh, the smallest possible i when your when your channel is simple it should be reflected by the fact that you need fewer fewer terms in the sum but in general all, the best you can do is what is written here nm so this uh, fact that it preserves the trace preserves the trace means that trace of u of a <coughs> is equal to trace of a okay this is easy to see what it means right it means that the trace of sum of vi star a vi is equal to trace of a. And so you immediately see that by the property of the trace, of course, vi star can go here. And so this means trace of a sigma vi vi star is equal to trace of a. And so you see that we can, here is a remark, OK? <coughs> so the quantum channel, OK? are characterized by the fact that the sum of vi, vi star is 1. Is it, is it, is it trace? Uh, that you Doesn't matter. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, you're, you're, you're right. So I, I should normalize the trace. It doesn't, uh, uh, well. Uh, Do they, well? I think I, I think that's what they do. Huh? <coughs> So the, the observation is just that. So the observation is. 
So the observation is just that, so, so for operator algebra, it's in the theory that you know, I, I sort of was talking about, the unital maps are privileged. Unital maps, unital completely positive maps would be, oh, I, 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 yeah, 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 yes, I switched, I switched. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is just a <laughs> stupid slip, right? Uh, of course, this VI star A, VI, and some reason, I don't know. Okay, it's one of these <laughs> bizarre things. Okay, so I've always written it this way today, I don't know. Okay, so this is what we, what we obtained. Okay, here I was consistent with the previous choices, so this is what, what I claimed, and then, <coughs> and then this is what, what translates the fact that the trace is preserved. So unital maps, unital maps would be such that sigma vi star vi is one, but trace preserving is in the other way. And this is, of course, a different condition. You can have one without the other. OK. So basically, in quantum information theory, uh, they're, they're, they're uh, interested in, in maps between uh, spaces of matrices or subspaces of spaces of, of matrices, but uh, this, this general theory turns out to, to be relevant for, for many things. Another example uh, of an application in the matrix case is something that in operator algebra we attribute to Choi. Maybe they have a name in uh, or, or channels that probably have a different name in quantum information theory, but I, I didn't memorize it. So, in fact, if we look at a, a map from MN to, okay, uh, uh, B of K, say, doesn't need to be, then the following are equivalent. Uh, it's the same to say that this U is CP, to say that U is uh, N completely positive, or did I say N positive? N positive, yeah, N positive. <coughs> and to say the, the following, to say that the, the, the matrix U of Eij, just as a matrix, so these are elements in B of K, and we form an N times N matrix, so that this is in Mn of B of K, and is positive. <coughs> so the, the interest of this statement the interest of this statement is that, you see, it is now reducing the fact that a, a linear mapping is completely positive to the fact that just one element, one element is positive. So this is why this, this statement is popular, because it, it does this simplification. Another thing that it does, we will see in a second a completely bounded analog that I want to sketch. Another thing that it does, which is also useful, is that when we are dealing with a simpler, you see, a simpler operator space, here this is in the domain. Later I'll discuss in the, in the range. So in the domain, this is Mn. So in fact, N positive is, is sufficient. Once we control N positive, it's a non-trivial fact, a priori, no, no reason really. When we contract N positive, in fact, all other positivity are a consequence. So uh, proof, well, as usual in this kind of thing, it should be something uh, fairly easy. So, okay, so this is trivial, right? And since completely positive means n positive for all n, this is obvious. Then this is uh, semi-trivial, okay? This is very easy. <coughs> Two implies three just because uh, maybe I, maybe that's a, maybe let's leave it as an exercise because the matrix, <coughs> uh, the matrix Eij tensor Eij that already <coughs> appeared. So this is a, a matrix in Mn of Mn. In fact, it is it is positive, and I think you can actually show that if you divide if you divide by n. Then, in fact, you get, maybe you already did it, uh, you, get, you get, in fact, a, a, a self-adjoint projection <coughs> on the, the Hilbert space, you know, that, 
natural here. So anyway, this is positive. So we will have if two holes. So if it is n positive, we will have that the sum of e i j, uh, you know, that we will have that the matrix. Sorry, this is. I'm, I'm screwing up the notation because because of because yes, just the e i j. <laughs> this is because of actually the next topic that's coming. Okay, so this matrix is, is positive, so it follows that the matrix U of Eij is in Mn of Bk plus, so three holes. Okay? So now, uh, wh why, why can we go back? So now assume three, and then we want to go back. So as I said, well, positive, the, 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 perhaps the, the way in this theory where often we use positive is to, to, to say that the elements can be written as uh, squares of Hermitian, or here doesn't really matter. It is clearer to say that this, is, this will be, if it is positive, we can write this as x star x, where x is in mn b of k, right? So that gives us that gives us that u of e i j is sum over k of some x k j with the obvious uh, <coughs> notation, and then here u of x k i star. Okay, this is this is what we get. So now u of u of a for any a in <coughs> m n. We will have that u of a is the sum of a i j u of e i j s since e i j is obviously this is a basis for m n so we have a we can develop a over this basis it gives us this so <coughs> sum over i j k of uh, x k i k i j x k j and you see you recognize. You're recognizing, you know, I hope you're, you're getting now the, the catch of this. You're recognizing the form that's typical of complete positivity. So how to make it more explicit? Well, you can make it like that. This is the sum over k of, uh, of this, this thing, sum over ij of x k. So let's fix k, x k, i squared, a i j x k j okay and so uh, uh, <coughs> so uh, let's see do, do, do I have it here um, <coughs> So now with all these xk, so xkj, these entries, they are bounded operators on k, okay? So I can write things like that. I can write it as, uh, this is uh, this thing here. I can write as a tensor uh, the identity. Okay, so, so let, let's, I, I claim that this is cp, <coughs> that this is cp, so this is uh, uk of a, and then, right here <coughs> the claim just recognize the, the form so claim is uk is completely positive so this is a sum of completely positive so it's completely positive so let, let's just <coughs> look at it uh, this way uk a xi uh, eta again so uh, now are you just writing that the matrix yeah y star y k star Anyway, that, that's that's what I'm going to do, but but uh, okay, just just uh, you see, side uh, are in K, and then this is uh, so this is uh, A I J, this is A tensor identity, and then uh, the sum of this uh, X J. Uh, J tensor uh, X K J. It is. I, I think it is probably up 
this is clear and then some over i over i Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just that, you know, the, the adjoint is, is just a, uh, you write it as a PK. <coughs> okay, so, so, so UK will be uh, A basically. Uh, So, so we have we have this column should be so so this will be this will be a tensor one v k uh, c v k eta okay maybe maybe that's the, the best way and then this this v k of c so c c is where so c c is going to be uh, in k. And VKC is is this this sequence, okay? So the sequence, uh, so we have uh, XK, which is in, yeah. so, so so this is tensor. It is <coughs> sum of PJ XKJ C. It must be that. So that's that's the sequence. Yes, yes. So that's in other words, you know, that's that's the sequence. If you like, this is the sequence, x k j, <coughs> x c viewed viewed as a <coughs> as a sequence of vectors. Okay, and so you view it as a sequence of vectors indexed by j. <coughs> you have your matrix a i j that acts on it, and then this is the same sequence of vectors indexed by i. Uh, I, I think I, what I wrote is is the correct formula. So it gives you, of course, that uh, this UKA is A tensor 1 uh, VK, VK star. The, the only unpleasant thing is that it would be nice to get immediately this, but you see we have an extra sum. So it is, in fact, uh, the reason I, uh, like that. We have it as a, a double sum. OK. So. I think we are good. And so that proves this uh, joy reserved. OK, now this was all completely positive. Completely positive is <coughs> main thing used quantum information theory, but we have a theory usually in parallel for complete boundedness. So for complete boundedness, we have a, a, a lemma uh, due to Roger Smith, <coughs> which says that uh, if you, you <coughs> fix, fix an integer n more than 1, and you consider uh, a linear map uh, u from e into mn, or you consider linear map from E to the continuous function on some, say, compact set omega with values in mn. So that's a tensor product, if you like. This is the tensor product <coughs> of sister algebras. This is a tensor product of sister algebras C omega, which is commutative with mn. Then the CB norm of u is actually equal to the norm of the map that we called un, so from mn of e to mn of mn. So it's a similar phenomenon as here in the sense that, uh, well, I've, I've changed I've changed n to, to capital N, but that doesn't matter. So if we go into uh, what's important is now this is the range, okay? Well, here this was the domain, okay? So that's a very important difference. So the range is mn. When we want to compute the completely bounded norm, then we can stop at n. It's rather economic. We stop at n, we have it. So I don't want to do the whole details, but I, I, I did things previously in detail which make it easy to 
to so, to so do it. So, sorry. What is the omega version? For in the omega compact, compact, omega compact, say. No, no, no. The right hand side in this. Uh, continuous functions with values no, in no. Mn. No. So what, how does this change, conclusion change? Is Mn now C of omega Mn, right? I'm sorry, I don't understand what is troubling you. The range of that mapping on the right side. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. C or, of omega oh, Mn. yes, sorry, sorry. Thank you. OK, oh, but, but actually, that, that, that second case reduces to the first one. Because you see, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the, the norm in C omega mn, it is the soup for each point in omega of the norm in mn. So you, know, you're, 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 you, you will just uh, be reduced to that case very easily. OK, so reduce to first case to u into mn, and then we need to show need to show that for any n uh, even much bigger than, than n, uh, we are going to have that the norm of u n is less than the norm of u n. And so uh, here is how you you can do it. So so the, the the hint let me just write it as a hint is that for any x one x n in L two capital N. Uh, with some xj <laughs> squared less than 1, there exists x1 tilde <coughs> xn tilde in the same Hilbert space. So we have a long sequence. n, you can think of, uh, you, you, you should think of little n as long because this is the whole point. You have a long sequence in this small dimensional Hilbert space with this condition. <laughs> Then you can actually find a, a short sequence with the same bound <coughs> and there exists a, a matrix B which will be a, <coughs> <that's> <laughs> which will be a, a, a matrix of size uh, little n, uh, big n, well sorry and I'm confused because I made the unfortunate choice that the capital N is <laughs> the small one. <laughs> so my, my language is totally confusing. <laughs> OK, so uh, B and N with norm B less than 1, of course, as, a, as an operator, as a matrix, and, and such that uh, you recover your original sequence xj by just acting uh, uh, on the, the other one. So this, this hint that I'm writing follows from the same trick that we had before. You, can, you introduce the Hilbert-Schmidt operator associated, OK? And this Hilbert-Schmidt operator, you just you know, go through the, the kernel. <coughs> it, it has a certain rank. The, obviously, the rank will be less than the smaller dimension. And so, so, so that's how you do it. And then with this trick, it becomes straightforward to finish the argument. OK. OK. Now, this gives us, in particular, OK, so in particular, we have, OK, note that uh, for any uh, u in, uh, with values in C omega, we have that the CB norm of u is equal to the norm of u. And this, this is something which, uh, you know, we, we more or less did before. Because uh, if you consider your, your AIJ, consider A in MN of E, and you consider U of AIJ, is he, call it FIJ in C of omega. Okay. You easily see that the norm of your u of a i j in this case is um, sorry uh, is, uh, yes is is uh, so is the soup of omega 
of the norm of the matrices f i j omega in m n. So if you if you introduce the the functional phi omega, which uh, belongs to uh, e star, which is phi omega of uh, x is equal to uh, u of x of omega, you have, of course, that phi omega <coughs> is less than the norm of u. And then you, you made me check already that linear forms, for linear forms, right, we know that complete <coughs> boundedness and uh, <coughs> boundedness are the same. So uh, I, I'm conscious that I'm duplicating, OK? But this is just for emphasis, just to show what it means, what this statement means in this very simple case, we, we, something we've already done. <coughs> and so you, you will get that uh, the norm of this Fij omega in Mn is what? This is, this is the norm of this phi omega of <coughs> Aij in Mn, OK? And we've checked already that linear forms are completely bounded just when they are bounded. So this is less than norm of phi omega times norm of A. <coughs> and so this is less than norm of U, norm of A. So the conclusion is indeed norm U C B <coughs> less than norm of U. And it must be equal because of course the completely bounded norm is always, always greater. So uh, in particular, so we have like uh, as a, so maybe I can I can state it as a as a proposition. But we did this already. There just is a, a linear variant. Okay. So if we have e uh, linear map to f in the operator space setting, so maybe I should say. Okay, call it proposition, it doesn't matter. We've, we've essentially already proved it. So we will have norm u equals norm u c b in the following cases. And then some case, some things, maybe I'll list the whole thing just to gain time and leave some stuff as exercise. Uh, so, uh, okay, if the the rank so so if uh, if the rank of u is 1 <coughs> okay rank of u is is 1 or less than 1 <laughs> uh, the the sister algebra generated by f is commutative Okay, why? Because in that case, in that case, we know by Gelfand theory that the sister algebra generated by F will be, <coughs> we, we are able, unital sister algebra can be identified with such a C omega, and then we are back exactly into the thing that we've detailed here. <coughs> and uh, so now, now I'm going to, I'm inserting now new information, new information because I am trying to save a little time. I spent too much time before. So we could have that E is equal to F is equal to R, the so-called rho Hilbert space, which I will define in a second. Or E is equal to F is equal to C, the so-called column Hilbert space. <coughs> And this is simply the following. The, the space R, by definition, is the closed span of E <coughs> first row. So E 1 J, J more than 1, in B of L 2. <coughs> also C in B of L 2. 
and this, this column space by definition is the close span of uh, the other guys, the I1, I superior or equal to 1. <coughs> So an element, if you want to picture an element of C, then, or let's I start with R. So an element of R, so then R is a certain by infinite matrix. And then if it is in R, it means uh, that it should have this, <coughs> this shape. It is, there is something on the first line and everything else is zero. And if X is in C, then uh, maybe if, y <coughs> is in C, then y equals yij uh, will be in the first column, non-zero on the first column, and zero uh, everywhere else. And you declare these to be orthonormal, is, is that the universal structure? Well, I don't declare because uh, this is for me the matrix units in B of L2. So this is the matrix that has one at the place ij and zero elsewhere. This Taking is e ij. E huh? Taking ej to e1. The operator oh, for this one. Matrix? For this one. Okay. Well, this is matrix. Yeah. It is a cycle of v of l2, right? Yeah, it's an upper of l2. Yeah. So okay. there are subspaces. There are subspaces of v of l2. So the elements, the elements of these spaces are, are matrices. Just we now allow infinite matrices, both in lines and columns. And there's no ambiguity, no problem. Of that. Everything clearly makes so sense. Is it just non-closure when you say closure? Yes. <coughs> and so observe that uh, maybe it's, it's important to observe that uh, if you consider uh, an element of, of R, so X, will be uh, the sum of uh, x, xk, uh, e, 1k. So this is an element of r. And then y sum of uh, <coughs> yk, e, k, 1. This is an element of c. It's important to observe that uh, the norm of x, now <coughs> the operator norm of x, the operator norm of x is actually the, the same as the <coughs> Hilbert space norm. And for, for y, the norm of y as an operator is also, in fact, <coughs> the same thing. It is the little l2 norm of the coordinates. So the consequence of this is that obviously r and c are isometric as Banach spaces. But they actually constitute a, a, a very, very fundamental example. This is the, the, the fundamental example of two spaces, very nice, both isometric to Hilbert space. Isometric, sorry, an isometric to L2 is <laughs> what I wanted to say. They're isometric to each other and it's both isometric to L2, but as operator spaces, they are not completely isomorphic. So this is, uh, this is an important, more important fact that I think it's a good idea to leave it also for this afternoon. <coughs> so an important uh, proposition, which I will leave as, as an exercise, it says, now if you consider a linear map not from R to R or from C to C, as was indicated here. But you consider a linear map that goes from R to C or that goes from C to R. Then the CB norm of U is not equal to the norm as was here, but it is equal to the norm of U as a Hilbert-Schmidt map. <coughs> Why can I talk of Hilbert Schmidt map now? I seem to be losing my head, you know, because, uh, well, no, I can't because, you see, I just told you these spaces are Hilbert spaces, actually. Okay, the norm, operator norm, happens to induce on this very simple row and column space, happens to induce the same norm as the usual norm of Hilbert space. So, as Banach spaces, they are Hilbert spaces, 
if I have a linear mapping between Hilbert spaces, obviously I can consider the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. The orthonormal basis, it's confusing if there was a question, <laughs> it makes it even more confusing. The orthonormal basis in the Hilbert space R is this guy, and, and it's this guy for, for C. Okay so, okay, so that's for the proof, we, we leave it as, as exercise. But the consequence is, the corollary is that these spaces are not completely isomorphism, not isomorphic as operator spaces. I think I, I didn't define yet what is a, a complete isomorphism. That means that there does not exist uh, the U from R to C, which is complete isomorphism. <coughs> and complete isomorphism, by definition, U from E to F is a, a complete isomorphism if it is, if it is uh, an isomorphism, linear isomorphism, which is CB as well as its inverse, such that <coughs> U and U minus 1 are both CB. So this is just the analog of the notion of isomorphism for operator spaces. It's quite right, easy to, to swallow, I think. There is a notion also that I didn't mention yet of complete isometry. So uh, a, a linear map between operator spaces is called completely isometric. So let's say complete contraction Complete contraction means norm UCB less or equal to 1. And complete isometry, complete isometry means that the map UN is an isometry for all N. So this is a map which is isometric, uh, but also at the level of matrices. So if we go to the level of n times n matrices with entries in E, then we will get this map UN that will be a isometric, isometric from MN of E to MN of F. And in this language, when we talk of complete isometry, the point is we mean non-surjective, okay? Non-surjective. So we distinguish isomorphism and isometry, isometry into. Yes? Does there exist a similar kind of thing even if you consider a second finite dimension that you have to show the two is theorem that you can go up to ten level and then take up to the probability of that? Similarly, does there exist anything like there in complete isometry? In complete you go isometry. Up to, up to certain extent and you say that you check the isometry. It is, yes, it, there is a problem, I think, in, in saying yes to you, I mean, in, for your question, in doing answering affirmatively your question because you observe that uh, here, uh, you see this works, we need the range to be like that. So there will be an answer to your question if you, the range and the domain are, because when you take the inverse, then your range will be the domain, the domain will become the range. So between two MNs, I can answer, yeah. But otherwise it's, uh, it's not so clear. Okay, I wanted to uh, here put one more statement in the same uh, spirit. Sorry, is this, are you going to prove this corollary or is this also an extra? Uh, yes, I was going to prove it because it's <laughs> easy enough. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so it's just uh, the, the proof of corollary is just, uh, you see, if, we, if we've done the, the real work is left in the proposition. So if you've done the work, if you consider your isomorphism uh, between these two things, if U is CB, you know that it is Hilbert-Schmidt, 
u minus 1 cb, you know that it is <coughs> Hilbert-Schmidt. So anyway, you're already done because Hilbert-Schmidt is compact. So in, dimen in infinite dimension, you cannot have an isomorphism on Hilbert space, which is compact unless the dimension is finite. So this is clearly an obstruction. But in fact, you see more precisely, uh, more precisely, uh, it's a, an interesting fact. So as a remark, this you could also do as an exercise, is that uh, you will have that uh, the infimum of norm u cb, norm u minus 1 cb, over all the maps from rn to cn. So rn and cn, if you allow me not to write it on the board because it takes time, is just the n-dimensional analog of row and column. So now we are in the good down, good old matrices, n times n matrices. We take all just the rows or just the columns. So you consider this. You can show that uh, this distance is equal to uh, <coughs> is equal to uh, square root of n, and uh, this is this is actually uh, quite interesting because this is this is the the smallest. Uh, this is actually the, the largest that that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. What, what is it? What distance was that? N. N. I. I, I just. Uh, I'm, Aaron to see it. It's n. Sorry, it's n. And uh, this is interesting because, in fact, it can be shown now. Now, this definitely would would not be an exercise. I think this would just take you too far. But it can be shown that this is extremal. So this is this is how to say, you know, you say best possible here. I want to say worst possible. <laughs> this is worst. Possible because it can be shown that for any EF n dimensional operator spaces, the infimum of norm u CB times norm u minus 1 CB over all maps between E and F is actually less or equal to n. So if you take an arbitrary pair of n-dimensional operator spaces, you can always find an isomorphism. OK, they're of the same dimension, so there always is a linear isomorphism. You can always find a linear isomorphism with the, 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 the isomorphism constant. Sometimes it's called a distortion constant now because Lipschitz functions are popular with this, this constant at most n. And when you look at these two spaces, you see that it realizes the worst, I mean, the largest, the largest distance. Actually, I was talking recently in Japan. I happened to be talking to, uh, after a talk I gave on Grotendieck's theorem, where these spaces appear all over the place. And uh, I was talking to, to Masamichi Takezaki afterwards, and he kept telling me about uh, the fact that operator spaces were a theory that that had orientation. And I didn't really understand what he meant by orientation. And what he had in mind was this, that you have, you have the, these two spaces correspond to operations which are orientations which are opposite, you know, which are opposed. And this, this result reflects the fact that they're, they're in the extremely opposed you know, uh, position. So the two spaces R and C are, are, are completely antagonistic. They're oriented in, you know, opposite directions. This is, it, was, it surprised me, the language surprised me, but this is. OK. So uh, Yeah, I, uh, in fact, in, in my book on operator spaces, which, by the way, I forgot to advertise. I advertised that I wrote a book on operator spaces. <laughs> Not only F. Rosen one <laughs> wrote a book on operator spaces. I have a whole chapter where I compute these parameters for essentially all the, the, the natural you know, spaces that, have, that, that I know. Okay. 
So what you're asking, I think, is in there. Or OK, uh, so one more proposition. I, I'm worried that I, I sort of patched together things to say. And then maybe now, having done the Choi thing, this might be obvious. So, so maybe uh, just as an emphasis, let, let's write this. Uh, for any A commutative, yes? <laughs> See, if you take, uh, if you take a, one of the permutation matrices, yes. Take a, a permutation of uh, the, the, the positive integer. Yes. And look at the diag diagonal on which it sits, where you have ones for the, that permutation matrix. Yes. And if you look at only those matrices with uh, that sum of uh, B of L two. Which are non zero entries around that type, sir, mm -hmm. around that mm -hmm. diagonal. Mm -hmm. Will they all be filled by non ethmorphic groups? But uh, if, you, if it's really a permutation, if I understand what you're asking, then, then it's going to be a copy of the n dimensional commutative C star algebra as an operator space. Because you see, you, you, you're an operator space theory, you, you don't need to conjugate. You can multiply just one time on the left or one time on the right. So then you're back into the identity uh, permutation. So if, if I understand what you're saying correctly, like for instance, something that has just non-zero here, you see, you can make it into the diagonal by just multiplying on the right once or on the left once. <coughs> Okay, one more. Uh, my gosh, my God. <laughs> one more result uh, that says uh, that we have automatically a, a complete conclusion from an ordinary assumption is that if, if we now have a u from a uh, to uh, b of k, now starting on a commutative C star algebra, so this is now isomorphic to some C omega, then u positive <coughs> automatically implies you, of course, I assume that it is bounded, right? So u positive implies u <coughs> completely positive. Now, I don't want to do the, the proof. I just leave maybe the, it, it's, it's actually terribly interesting to do. But ju just observe that if the dimension of A is equal to, <laughs> to n, so then your, your A will be isomorphic to L infinity n, so this is just, uh, if you like, the, 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 the space of all diagonal <coughs> matrices. That's what I call L infinity n, okay? <coughs> Sitting inside mn. Well, actually, it's, it's a good transition, but I didn't realize but from your question. <coughs> and, and then, you see, so uh, a linear map from this L infinity n to B of k is positive. It's, it's easy to see that u is, is positive <coughs> if and only if just the, the u of, OK, with my notation, so u of e j j <coughs> is positive for all j. And so you see that your u of x will be the sum of uh, x, OK, j j. Maybe, maybe I, I, I shouldn't write this j j, so x is equal to sum of xj, say, ejj. <coughs> and then you find your sum of xj times some positive operators aj. OK. And so I, I, I claim that this is going to be automatically completely positive because, well, once again, essentially, let, let me also not spell out because every time I do it, I have some sort of problem. So let, I, I leave you to, to correct <coughs> the statement, OK, that this is this times 
this square root of a1, square root of a. Maybe, maybe I'll write it like that. V star. I, I, I write it abusively, okay? <laughs> but then, then you read it, when you read it in your notes, I think it, it, it's clear. So. Okay, but you, this, a, this matrix should be thought of tensor the identity because there is, as usual, an extra k factor. So I leave, leave it as an exercise. This is a sketch. But it's, it's important to, to know this. And since you're probably wondering, every time you know there is such a statement, you're probably wondering in the way things have been presented what happens in the other case. So here, we have if the domain if the domain is commutative we have that positive implies completely positive so you're surely wondering well what about boundedness no it's not true of, uh, z j a j <coughs> over z j less than one z j in c in this uh, setting here but uh, this is different this is definitely can be smaller <coughs> than the the CV norm. Maybe I can write, I will write an expression for the, the CV norm. <coughs> so, again, for this, this U here, <coughs> the CV norm is the following it is the infimum the norm of sum of uh, x j oops, x j x j star one over two times the sum of y j star y j one over two over all the ways that you can factor this a j as uh, x j y j. So now a j is not necessarily positive. This is again this u of ujj and uh, xjyj of course in, in b of k. So this is incidentally some people have an interest in questions that they asked me about injective von Neumann algebras. So here again if you, if you put a, an injective von Neumann algebra this, this essentially will be true this formula here, but actually uh, there is a paper by Ufa Hagerup from 85 on that. In fact, this, this formula here, when you consider it with values in the von Neumann algebra, and this is important, and the decomposition is in the von Neumann <coughs> algebra, it actually characterizes injectivity. Even for n equal to, there is something open about the, the smallest n for which this characterization holds. So I think. I think he has it for, uh, I, 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 I lose track, but he has it. Oh, I, I think, no, I, I, now I remember, yeah. There is indication that even when n is equal to 3, if this formula that I wrote is valid in a von Neumann algebra, the von Neumann algebra is injective, but this is not proved. And what he proves is if it's true for all n, then it is injective. I think I remembered this correctly, but I uh, don't guarantee. Okay, <coughs> so I hope that things are starting to fall into place. We have examples, which is always good. I, I'm tempted to continue with examples because it's sort of more concrete, but So let me, let me at least insert two more exercises which are, uh, you know, fairly simple once you have the, the canonical factorization. So, and they are very important. They're about sure multipliers. <coughs> so, so consider, okay, so maybe let's, let's, let's be simple. It doesn't matter. You can extend it in a, so consider a sure multiplier uh, m phi 
from, let's say, from Mn to Mn. So we take this uh, omega u, okay, so u, u phi from Aij goes to Aij phi ij. So phi ij, <coughs> let's say, complex numbers, but this can also be <coughs> pretty much generalized. My, my chalk is getting shorter and shorter, but uh, I still have a few. Oh, maybe this. Sorry, this, this is plenty. So uh, then the CB norm, the CB norm, this linear transformation, which is, uh, as I'm sure you've heard, called a Shaw multiplier. So, you know, this is the, they call it the matrix multiplication of bad students. <laughs> So the CB norm is, is the infimum. It's a little bit strange, but that's, a, that's an important uh, definition. It's the infimum of the following. The soup of uh, uh, normal Xi in Hilbert space times soup of normal Yj in Hilbert space over J, where this infimum is over all possible ways that you can write your matrix like this with uh, X i y j <coughs> in a Hilbert space, and uh, the remark is that you can may assume may reduce <coughs> obviously to dimension of h less or equal to n. So that's sure multipliers on matrix algebras, and another important example of sure multiplier is on the reduce sister algebra of a group. So this would be another example. So maybe one and two. So if G is a discrete group, you consider the reduced sister algebra of G, which is the sister algebra generated by the representation lambda from G to bounded operators on L2G, which is left translation. So lambda G of delta T is equal to delta GT. So this is left translation by G. So that's a unitary representation. Every time you have a unitary representation, the linear span, the closed linear span, is going to be a sister algebra. So this is, this is actually the closed span <coughs> of <coughs> lambda t, t, and the g, g, g. So again, you can consider now a, a multiplier that is defined on this linear span, since this is the closure of this linear span. I won't uh, go to I don't want to be too formal, so this sum, maybe finite sum, let's say finite sum, okay, goes to the sum of xj phi g lambda g. So this is, this is the analog of a sure multiplier in this algebra, and in fact, let me not extrapolate too much what I want to say. In fact, there is a connection because uh, you can show that this is the restriction of, multi of a multiplier in this form acting on bounded operators on L2G. However, and, and there is a connection between the two characterizations, but it is, it is, not, it is not entirely trivial. And uh, the point is that now, the, oh, I forgot an important thing. Okay. But I will bring it in the end. Sorry, it just hit me. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So here the M phi, oh, I shouldn't note it like this, so if I want to, okay, so M, 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 so, uh, 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 okay, uh, M, 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 U, so T, T phi, okay, will be this, so the, the, the norm of T phi as a completely bounded map is, is so it's, it's actually formally analogous soup over uh, S in G of norm of X, S in H, soup T in G, norm of Yt in H. So 
the infimum of the product of this soup over all possible ways. So we allow infinity, OK? If it's infinite, then, well, it's not completely bounded. So such that we can write phi of when s. Sorry? When does dp make sense? Well, I, I wish I knew. <laughs> this you is actually not so easy. Is. But <laughs> OK, let me, let me just finish. OK, so, so formally, I can define, uh, I, I think, what Sundar wants me to make clear is that, so I, I'm formally defining this on, on finite sums. OK, so finite sums. Because this is the closure of the linear span. So I look at this guy on finite sums. And then <coughs> this, this formula uh, encapsulates the fact that if the right-hand side is finite, then, in fact, it is bounded and even more completely bounded. Okay? And then it, it fits. That is, if you cannot find a representation of this form for your multiplier, it means that it is not completely bounded. Okay, so you have a formula, strange formula, but a good formula like this. So what I'm saying, I'm, I'm proposing this as exercises because this formula here, both, and this formula here are easy consequences of the fundamental factorization of completely bounded maps. Really, all you have to do is write it, and if you know what you're looking for, you will get it out of the, very, very easily. So that's nice. However, there's an important difference, which is that here, for the... For the u phi here, it's a fact that uh, the norm of u phi, this might be a little bit more tricky as an exercise, but <coughs> it is uh, nevertheless true. <coughs> the, the norm and the CB norm of this matrix sure multipliers are the same automatically. Um, however, I, 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 don't think, I don't think I have it from all the things, all the material that I brought up, you know, today, I don't think I can pull it out. I think it's, it's like it's, it's something else. Uh, nevertheless, this is, this, this is true. And here it is not so. So here it is known that this is different. So here, however, the norm of T phi is different from, so this is a, a dangerous term in the Bourbaki notation. CB. So there are, there are actually examples of multipliers. That would be a, a bit tricky exercise, but it's, so if, you, if you know a little bit harmonic analysis on the free group, then you very easily see that there are multipliers that are bounded, but not completely bounded. And I bring up the free group because if the group is amenable, then, <coughs> then it's going to be true, actually. So, so you, need something. you need something sufficiently complicated. Okay, and then here finally another uh, insertion is that here this u phi will be completely positive if and only if the matrix Pij <coughs> is positive. But this this one this one I think we have probably from from choice from choice from a corollary of you know the, the result of choice. So this. Okay. So let me now uh, start discussing one theorem, which is long overdue. So the, the theorem is, is this. When, when E is, is an operator space, okay, you've noticed that we have a, a sequence of norms that we can define for matrices over E, which uh, are the norms of uh, X in MN of E. So to, to E, 
we can associate uh, a sequence of norms n uh, on mn of e and more than one. So you can you can actually forget all about e and just now consider the, the vector space mn of e, okay, that just makes sense, matrices with entries the elements of e, equipped with the, such a norm. And what Rouen's theorem does is that he actually identifies, he actually identifies the abstract axioms that a sequence of norms like this abstractly must satisfy in order to come from a, a real operator space, a, a concrete operator space, so to speak, realized as a space of operators. This seems to be maybe not so, uh, you know, dramatic, but in fact, it, it, it has turned out to be incredibly useful. It has lots of applications because it allows to actually define operator spaces without worrying of the concrete realization. So we can play, you know, with operator spaces just by manipulating these norms. Let me just point that philosophically it is quite a natural thing because in fact if you recall the way we've defined the morphisms with operator spaces, with the morphisms with operator spaces are the completely bounded maps. Okay? To define a completely bounded map, all we needed was this. This is all we needed. We had this map UN going to matrix, then we had the norm of UN. That's all we need. So in fact, it, it is you know it's kind of a satisfactory uh, result that we can really have a, uh, we have an idea what's the minimal structure that make, you know, completely bounded maps work. Okay, so these satisfy two, two axioms, so we have two properties uh, which are easily verified <coughs> for that, which are this, that uh, the norm of uh, <coughs> the norms that are here satisfy this for any n and m more than one and any x in mn of e, any y in m, m of e. And the second axiom is that uh, if I multiply, so maybe I'll write it like that, so this is less than norm a, MN, <coughs> norm X, or maybe I should, well, okay, norm X in MN of E, norm B in MN, <coughs> for any AB in MN, and for any X, X in MN of E. Okay, definitely these two axioms, two very innocent axioms are satisfied when we are dealing with operators because you see the first one means that we are looking at our operator that symbolized by x and by y, we are looking at the block direct sum of these operators and when we take a block direct sum of operators just like a diagonal matrix the norm is the max of the norms of the diagonal blocks. So definitely we, we have this if it is an operator space and the second one is also very innocent because we, we have our, our matrix with operator entries x. This is x is in mn of e, so it has priori operator entries. But a and b are scalar matrices. So if we multiply left and right, of course, uh, the usual product rule applies, and the norm will be less than the product of the norm, so it, it acts like that. And so it is the, the remark that matrices with entries in e, which is just a vector space, it has scalar, it admits scalar multiplication. So matrices over this vector space admit matrix multiplication, but of course, with the entries scalar, okay? So A and B being scalars, this makes sense. We do left or we do right, of course, the scalar multiplication is just scalar multiplication. So the theorem of one. <coughs> says that uh, the converse is true. So if E is a vector space, complex, because, well, we want to do operator theory, so 
into complex vector space and <coughs> norm n is a sequence of matrix, it's a sequence of norms on each, well, norms on mn of e. Okay, so for each n, norm n is a norm on mn of e. Then it's the converse, so if one and two holes, if one and two hold, there exists a, 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 a linear a linear map E, there exists a there exists a, an H and there exists a, a linear map E, a linear map J from E into B of H such that uh, the norms n, norms n are the norms associated to the concrete operator space. This is, I'm introducing the terminology at the same time, which is what everybody uses, the concrete operator space. J E sitting in B of H. Explicitly, this means for any N and for any X in M N of E, the norm of X N is simply so the norm of <coughs> X yes, N is simply the norm of the matrix J of X I J in M N of B of K. So, how does one prove such a such a that? So, so let me uh, start the proof and then stop uh, in five minutes. So, the start of the proof, or maybe outline of the proof, outline. Of the proof is this: we we consider uh, we will show that uh, it all depends on the suffices. To prove the following claim. It suffices to prove the following claim. So we're going to have the Han Banach theorem involved here as, as usual. So for any n and for any x in uh, oops, m n of e with, let's normalize, so with norm x n equals to 1, there will exist a, a j so this, this j is really going to depend on, on, on x. So x is an mn, so on x and n, if you like, so on n and <coughs> x. From e to some, uh, some h, so there exists an, an h, also an x, v and x, such that this goes from e to b of h. <coughs> and such that, such that the, the following holds. So first, the, the, the norm of x, so, so the, the norm of g n x of y of x i j So the norm of g and x of this, this particular x, when we computed it in <coughs> mn of b of h, 
then we want it to be 1. So it is the same as, as this guy. But for all the others, it should be less than 1. So, but uh, <coughs> for any m and for any y in m, m of e, <coughs> Uh, we want that uh, j of, uh, I will drop the, I will drop the indices is less than norm of y, m. Sorry? But I want to drop it, so yes, yes, you know, I, I, I want to drop it, so so j equals j and x, h, and I want to economize because this, it's a mess. If you, I think it's better not to be, just remember, it does depend, okay, it does depend. So maybe I write it someplace and I don't, so that's inconsistent. You, you, you're allowed, legitimately, you can criticize, but. Uh, let's leave it like that. It's, it's too, too messy. So, in other words, if these norms, if these norms, abstract norms, were norms of operator spaces, that would mean that we are creating this J, which is a complete contraction. That's what the second property would mean. That just attains, it realizes the right norm on the X that we, we fixed. So after uh, you have this claim, then the conclusion it's just easy, you could then define <coughs> your, your, your map J from E to some, to some Hilbert space H, where H is going to be some huge, huge abstract Dirac sum, but this is, just doesn't matter, it's for the, the argument, okay, over all <coughs> Hilbert spaces, all NX, and which just takes your, your E to uh, the, the block Dirac sum operator of your <coughs> J NX. E, so here I, I do need, of course, these indices, okay? <coughs> and uh, then J satisfies the conclusion, <coughs> conclusion of one's <coughs> theorem, because if we uh, now consider an arbitrary Y, we have that uh, <coughs> the norm of uh, J, if we consider If we now consider the, the norm, so what, what, what conclusion meaning, okay, so let's try to get the conclusion here, okay? So we get the conclusion here. So maybe, <coughs> maybe let, me, let me write it, let me just change the notation. <laughs> uh, this is, okay, change the notation maybe, maybe later. So if I now fix <coughs> x in mn of e, let me, let me change the notation in the, in the next line, okay? So the, what is the norm of j, x, i, j in mn of b of this script h? So if this is this embedding, and if I choose the, to, if I just, you know, change the notation to the soup over my, which just is a change of letter, <coughs> my, okay? So then I'm going to have <coughs> the soup over m and y <coughs> of here this, J M Y <coughs> X I J okay. in uh, now M N <coughs> of uh, B of H M Y. Okay. So one thing I have is that this is less. This is less. <sighs> yes, so this is, this is definitely less than the norm of x n by the second property, so maybe I write it like that, too. Okay, you have to, I, I, I think I can't sort of avoid this, this juggling with, with notation, okay, because <coughs> all these all these embeddings, all these embeddings J, M, Y, or J and X are, are done so that if I, <coughs> if, I change, if I change my entry, anyway it is contractive, okay? So if I'm, if I'm so to speak, 
uh, you know, away from the diagonal, anyway it is less than. But if I now pick the equality case, if I now pick m equals to n and y equals to x, then the first part gives me that it is greater than 1. So <coughs> I will have that for any x with norm x, n equals 1. <coughs> OK, I have that uh, this is also greater than 1 by 1. I actually, this normalization is, is actually not essential. But you know, anyway, we're dealing with norms, so we can normalize. So this is this is how the how the proof goes. It is uh, it has uh, some analogy with uh, you know Gelfand's theorem. If you remember the proof of Gelfand's theorem, how you show given the abstract you know definition of a C-star algebra that you can realize it as a concrete algebra. Well, you know you look at uh, your state and, and from the state you create a, a GNS representation that uh, that. Then when you pile them up all together with the direct sum over all states, produce the Gelfand embedding. So this is the analog of the Gelfand theorem in some sense for operator spaces. Thank you very much. <laughs> not yet, not yet finished. <laughs>